Kia ora koto katoa. Welcome to our second day of the conference. Today, we are going to spend quite a bit of time talking about organizing from the global south and looking at the ways in which organizing flows across the global south into the spaces of diaspora in the north, connecting it to migrant and refugee organizing. Yavra, good morning. This is Mahabub Rahman. I am now doing PhD on communication and journalism at Messi University. Besides doing my PhD, I'm also working as a research assistant at as Center for Culture Center Approach to Research and Evaluation Care. And I started my PhD journey from March 2020. And before starting my PhD, I started to work with care and dealing with the refugee community. So my today's presentation is refugee organizing at the margins. So I will talk with the refugee people living in outer New Zealand, mainly living in Palmerston North. I am dealing with the Rohingya refugee people. At first, I would like to say who are Rohingyas or Rohingyas, because you know, International media sometimes call them at Rohingyas. Rohingyas or Rohingyas, they are the largest stateless people of the world. Though international media call them at Rohingyas, but the people themselves love to call them as Rohingyas. I have taken more than 100 interviews of the Rohingya people, and they all mentioned that they love to call them as Rohingyas. Because you know, the term Rohingya is still banned in their country that is Myanmar. So the term Rohingya or the ethnicity of Rohingya is still banned in Myanmar or Burma. So who are Rohingyas? Rohingyas are the Muslim ethnic minority people living in the Rakhine state of Myanmar for centuries. The previous name of Rakhine state is Arakan state. And the previous name of Myanmar is Burma. Mm. Though Rohingyas have been living there for centuries, but unfortunately, they are not recognized as citizens of that country. They are rather they are tortured, persecuted by the Myanmar authorities. Mm -hmm. And it has been started from 1982 until today, it is going on. Yeah. And as a result, they always try to escape the violence and use them and try to take refuse in other countries of the world. Now I'd like to say something about the historical background of the Rohingya refugees. In 1785, that is kingdom of Arakan, now that is Rakhine state, it, it was captured by the Bar Burmese authority, at that time, Burmese authority in 1785. So in 1785, Rakhine state becomes a part of Burma. And in 1824 to 1826, there was a war between anglo burmese or that is British and Burmese people, and Burma becomes a British colony in 1984. I would like to say, if you look at the map, Bangladesh, India, Burma, that's Myanmar, are close neighbors. So Burma became the British colony in 1824. Before that, India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, that is Greater India, was the colony of British. So Greater India became the colony of British in 1757, but Burma became the colony in 1824. Mm -hmm. So the whole part, if you see the map, whole part was the colony of British from 1757 to 1947. So India and Pakistan became independent from the British in 1947. Seven, but, and but the Myanmar got independence in 1948. So after getting independence, the Rohingya people got some rights. They just enjoying the citizenship rights and other rights also after getting the independence. But at that time, from 1948 to 1962, there is a, there was a civilian government. But when in 1962, military took the power. And after taking power by the military, 
all rights started to, I, what should I say, Rohingya lost all their rights in Myanmar. And, <clears throat> and their, their persecutions, their sorrow started from 1962. And in 1982, a, a special citizenship law was formulated by the military government. That is 1982 citizenship law. And that law excludes Rohingya people from their citizenship right. So from 1982, they're totally stateless. And from 1982 to till today, they're trying to escape the country because the persecutions, violence against them, they did not have any rights in their country. As the authority mentioned them, you are not the citizen, so you do not have any rights. So they are all types of violent activities were occurred against them. And the latest on occurred in 2017, and at the time, more than 1.2 million people bound to leave their Myanmar state, and they got shelter in Bangladesh. But from 19, here is, here is the picture from 1982, when they become stateless, so th they do not have any rights in their country. So they tried to escape country, that motherland Myanmar, and try to get refuge in other countries of the world. Mainly, the, mainly they go to the neighboring countries, that is Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Thailand, Laos, Malaysia, because that is very close neighbors. Mm -hmm. So they try to get refuge there, but they also try to take shelter in distant countries, even in Australia, by um, they try to get shelter in Australia coming by boats also. So, but mainly the, the neighboring countries, they try to escape and get shelter. And if you see the figure, Bangladesh now sheltering more than 1.6 million Rohingya people. Then Pakistan, around 500,000. Saudi Arabia, around 500,000. But Saudi Arabia, Arabia, where the Rohingya people are living, they also get go, try to go to the Saudi Arabia from Bangladesh, India, or, or Pakistan, because uh, they in religiously, Rohingya people are Muslims. So as Saudi Arab, is, is they, they think, Muslim people think, as Mokka and within our in Saudi Arabia, they always try to go to the Saudi Arabia. So, mm -hmm. so they started to go to the Saudi Arabia in 1972 or 1978 or 1982. From that time, they started to settle in Saudi Arabia. But in all over the countries, whether Bangladesh, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Malaysia, Indonesia, where they settle down, not settle down, they try to get refuse. They do not get the even the refugee status. They are just um, turned by the, the those government as a illegal immigrants. In Bang whether it is Bangladesh or in the Malaysia or in the Indonesia, they are not even treated as a refugee. So now there are around 3.5 million Rohingya people all over the world, but they do not have any estate. They do not have any citizenship right. They even they do not have any document. There is, if I talk about the refugee, if I think about the who who are the refugees, the one who is forced to leave their home country because of or political or religious oppression or persecution there and take shelter to other countries, they are refugees. So by definition, Rohingyas are definite, definitely the refugees because they are forced to leave their country from Myanmar and seek refuge to various countries, but they are not recognized as refugees, even in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. In Bangladesh, Rohingya is termed as a forcibly displaced Myanmar national. In Malaysia, they, they are termed as illegal migrants. In Pakistan, in India, same. They are not even treated as refugees, because when a country termed them or mentioned them as refugees, country thinks that they, they definitely have some rights because refugees have some rights. Mm -hmm. So these countries do not term them refugees. And they're also not the, uh, the, the these countries also do not sign the 1951 and 1967, the refugee protocol, refugee law. So they are not treat them as refugees, though they are taking shelter in this country. But the UN bodies, for example, UNHCR and other bodies call them as refugees. So, and even bodies call them at refugee, so Rohingya refugees got some resettlement opportunity. And in New Zealand or Australia or USA, there are some refugee, Rohingya refugees that are now living by getting the 
third country resettlement opportunity. So if, if I consider the, as my talking in the refugee organizing in Australia, New Zealand, so now, you, now I would like to say something about the refugee condition in New Zealand. From 2000, the Rohingya refugees got started to get the third country resettlement opportunity to resettle in New Zealand. And now there are around 1,500 Rohingya refugees living in New Zealand, in Palmerston North, Auckland, and other cities they try to settle down as according to the government, which are according to the government law. So you, you can consider there are Rohingya people are now more than 3.5 million Rohingya people, but only 1,500 is settled in New Zealand. And if we consider the situation from 1982 to till today, around 30,000 Rohingya refugees get the resettlement in various developed countries. And only 30,000, though they are now the community of more than 3.5 million, and they are totally stateless. So now, now, now I would like to talk something about the Rohingya situation in outer New Zealand. So from 2000, Rohingya started to resettle in New Zealand. And, and if we consider the Palm Eastern North, from 2017, they started to come to the Palmy. And now there are 50 Rohingya families living in Palmy. And they, they came under the UNHCR third country resettlement process. And I started to deal with the Rohingya refugee community of Palm North since 2020. To deal with the Rohingya refugee people, uh, I utilize the culture center approach. We know that culture center approach is a meta theoretical framework working through a structure, culture, and agency. It is actually culturally centering communication process for the communities at the margins of the margins. As I mentioned, Rohingya community definitely the margins of the margins people because they are totally marginalized. If we consider, if we just differentiate between Rohingya refugees and other refugees. If we consider Syrian refugees, if we consider Afghan refugees, they all have some document. They have some, some, they have some, they have the passport of their country. But if you consider the Rohingya refugee people, they do not have any document. The people living in the outer New Zealand, the only document they have that is there, and that is permanent residency document given by the UNHCR and given by the New Zealand government. They even do not have any document. So this, this is the difference between other refugee and Rohingya refugee. So if we consider the definition of margins of the margins, Rohingya refugee community, definitely the margins of the margins community of the world. So I started to deal with the Rohingya refugee community in 2020. According to the culture center approach, so at first I would like to build up relationship with the Rohingya refugee community people, because without building relationship, even I was not allowed to enter into the community. So what I started to work as per the advice of Professor Mohan Dotto, to if you want to build up a relationship with the community, at first you may, according to the culture center approach, a community researcher is needed. Through community researcher, we can enter into a community and then talk with the people. So I tried to find out the community researcher, and you know, though I ought in Bangladesh as a news producer and dealing with the Rohingya ref refugee crisis since 2017. But after coming to New Zealand, it was totally unknown to me how many Rohingyas are living here, though I know now, now, but at that time, I do not know how many Rohingya people are living in Palmerston North. What is their situation? How can I take in-depth interview of them? So as per the advice of Professor Mohan Dotto, I tried to find out the community researcher. And this is the photograph. He's my, he was my community researcher of my first interview. He's the Rohingya people, and he came to New Zealand in 2016 or 17. And then at first, you know, Rohingya refugee people, after coming to New Zealand, they spent six weeks at the Mangri refugee camp, and then they are resettled in various cities. It's the process of New Zealand government. At first, six six weeks at the Mangi refugee camp. They stay there and they, they are given some knowledge about the new country, new culture, new environment, and they are distributed to the respective community and respective cities. And then they come to the, like Palmi or other cities. So at first I tried to find out a community researcher and 
at that time, as I am a Bangladeshi, so I utilized my local connectivity to find out the Rohingya researcher. And then I find that community researcher. And you know, according to the culture center approach, there are some training given to the community researcher, training, induction, mentoring, support, etc., given through me by the care center. And also the organizing the material resource, because if you want to collect data from a community, the community researcher needs some support. And that support is given by the care center. Now I would like to say something about the culture center research process, what challenges and what solutions I face while collecting data from the Rohingya refugees living in Palmi. So when at first I just find out the community researcher, then I try to enter into the community. Then according to culture center approach, at first I think about my positionality. So I, 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 I was working as a PhD student and I am also a, was working as a journalist and also a researcher, but they are the Rohingya refugee community. And if I think about Professor, he's a senior academic. So how, thinking about the positionality, we always think, that how can I build up the relationship with the Rohingya refugee community? There are some positive things that help me to build a relationship with the Rohingya refugee community. Me and the participant having similar belief system, that is, we are similar belief, we are Muslims. And as the Rohingya refugee community living just beside Bangladesh, and because you know Myanmar and Bangladesh just neighbor, so we have some cultural similarity. That also helps me to enter into the Rohingya refugee community. And another thing, my language is Bangla, Bengui language, the Rohingya people, they, are, they have a special language, that is Rohingya language, but Rohingya language and Bangla language more or less similar. So if I talk with them, my Bangla language, they also understand maximum of them. And the community researcher also understand Bangla. So that helps me to build up the relationship with the, uh, the new community. At that time, I can, I can think, even I do not know, how can I find out a Rohingya refugee participant? Professor asked me, how well, we should try to find it out. And even I, if I decollect, I have to wait minimum 15 or 30 days to find out a Rohingya refugee community to take that interview. And another thing, you know, color, race, are the same for me and for, also for the participants. And the maximum of them understand Bengali and they also understand Hindi. Me also understand Hindi. So that all helped me to make a good relationship with the Rohingya refugee people. And while you're working with the Rohingya refugee people, the reflexivity, it always thinks about self-consciousness, awareness, and any mode of self-analysis, what I am doing for the people. Is it okay for them or not? Always I am thinking about that. And there I, I think at first I have to build up the trust because in, in culture center approach, we generally take the in-depth interview in the house of the participants. So we, if they do not trust you, then you, you are not, you will not be allowed to enter into that house. So building trust, building initiative is very much important in culture center approach. So we, I try to build up the trustworthiness and when I am taking in-depth interviews, I am taking notes, memos, that also help about my reflexivity. For example, when I enter into the Rohingya refugee house, we are just sitting down on the mat and just then talking about them. So they're just thinking that, yes, he is also just like me. Because another thing I should mention, as the Rohingya refugee people getting some shelter, so sometimes I think, is it any power dynamics between them and I, because Bangladesh is giving their shelter. So I always try to think about the power relationship between me and the Rohingya refugee people. Even I, sometimes I just mention myself, yes, you are on the student visa, but you think, Rohingya, though, though they are the Rohingya refugees, but they are the permanent resident of New Zealand. Mm -hmm. That I'm also some, sometimes thinking about me to build a relationship with them. And another thing, community agency and voice. Color Center approach believe that community should have some voice. And according to the community voice, community voice reflects the local agency. So community voice, what is community voice for defining problems and identifying solution. And as a, as a research that my duty was to find out their voice. And another thing in Color Center approach, we believe that we should not be a neutral observer, but we should be a listener. So listening to the community is one of the 
I, what should I say? One of the quality of culture center approach, one of the quality of the academic, one of the quality of the research are to you have the capacity to listen to the community. Because if, if you don't have the listen to the community, then you cannot find out their voice. And another thing in culture center approach, we utilize the, the questionnaire. If we, if we compare it with other approach, their structure is question protocol. Questionnaire protocol is fixed. But in culture center approach, our questionnaire protocol is not fixed. We are just starting to talk with them, engage in discussion, and it is open-ended discussion. And that helps us to find out the community voice. And as in the first discussion, Mohua mentioned, yes, as a researcher, as, as an academician, you have the belief, you have the power to placing your body on the line. That is, you have you have to place your body on the struggles of the participants. Yes, you have to know the struggles of them. And you have, as a, I think it is the mainly the power or mainly the quality of, the, of an activist. But in case of car center of approach, as a researcher, you, have, you must have the capacity to place your body on the struggles of the participants. Otherwise, it is difficult to find out their, their problems, their voice, what the problems they're facing. So researcher should have prepared themselves to the place your, their body on the struggles of the participants. So it also helps me sometimes. I have more than five years experience while I am working in Bangladesh television, and I know what is the Rohingya crisis. So it helps me to place my body on their struggles. And I also, out of their struggles while they are staying in Bangladesh in the Rohingya refugee camp, and I also know the situation while they are staying in Malaysia. In Malaysia, Rohingya refugee people are not staying in camps. They are staying in different places. And I also know some, just discussing with them, the present scenario of Rohingya refugee people in out there in New Zealand. So in Rohingya refugee people who are now living in out there in New Zealand, the main barrier they face is the linguistic barrier. Building relationship, I, I build with them through the culture center approach. And, and now the Rohingya people, if they face any problem, they come to me and try to uh, ask me because I now work with them as a linguistic support. Because you know, in Australia, New Zealand, every document comes through the mail or a hard copy. Generally, but they do not understand the hard copy or the mail. Even they cannot open a mail. Mm -hmm. And the last thing, solidarity. Yes, you you have to show your solidarity to the uh, to the community where, where we are working. So always, I, I, I was aware of, of my solidarity. Yes, I am showing my, that is, we should say, showing empathy for the struggles of Rohingya refugees, not the sympathy, but the empathy. And I always spend time to listen to the struggles of the participants. And I always try to educate them in the pedagogy of securing services. There are various services are available for the Rohingya refugee people, even they do not know what services are available to them. Though they are now living in permanent North or in New Zealand under permanent residency visa, but even they do not know all the services. Another thing, the shared responsibility. Yes, we have, as a researcher, we always think we have the shared responsibility for the participant. And another thing, if you want to show your empathy or if you want to work for the community, you should be resourceful. And the other thing, you should be respectful to the participants. And I, always I think about me, yes, I am showing that, showing my respect to them or not. Because without, if the participant or the community, if a, part, a researcher cannot show their respect to them, so it is very difficult to make relationship with the community. And Professor Mohandut always negotiating with the legal and hate structure while working with the color center approach. Yes, now working with the Rohingya refugee people, now I, I can say, I, though I started in 2020, now a good relationship of, is already built up with them by me. And I know all the Rohingya refugee people living in Palma North. Though there are 50 families here, but still, yes, building relationship is, can be a sip. But while working with the Rohingya refugee community, we do face some challenges. It's mainly for the uh, the family violence and sexual violence project while we are working with the Rohingya refugee people, we face some challenges. Uh, I should say something about the family violence and sexual violence project. 
it was my second project while working in care. So at first, I was given responsibility to take some interview of the Rohingya refugee people because they are the part of my grand people. And the family violence and sexual violence project, it was decided that we will take four community interview, my grand people, Asian community, rainbow community, and disabled community. As Rohingya refugee people is a part of my grand community, so it was my responsibility to take some interview of the Rohingya refugee people. And accordingly, I took about five or seven interview of the Rohingya refugee people. And in the in family violence and sexual violence project, there is a system that every, every week or every two weeks, we have a meeting with the Crown people about our update, what, we, what is going on and everything. But while <coughs> during a meeting, there was a conversation between uh, between a between a Pakhao man and a Brahmin woman, that but he, he she is she is also a, a New Zealand citizen, I think. So they are talking about Islamophobia or our orcs on, for example, our margins of the margins methodology. And how could how could we find out? Then I would like to request Professor to say something about the about the challenges. Kia ora. <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Mabu. And I really appreciate you articulating the framework of the culture-centered method and the framework of the margins of the margins. So for this part of our uh, case that we are reporting in uh, this chapter, we will draw upon our ethnographic uh, journal notes. Um, so going back to the context of the uh, crown infrastructure within the framework of the family violence, sexual violence uh, work, um, uh, the um, interviews carried out with Rohingya at the margins of the margins were shaped by this notion that Rohingya refugees within the infrastructure of migration are often erased from the discursive uh, space because of the multiple layers of violence, um, including the violence of genocide and uh, sexual violence that forms the experiences of Rohingya people expelled from Myanmar. Um, so, in the conversation that Mahbubur is referring to was um, a conversation that was held as part of um, engaging with key stakeholders in the migrant space. And uh, the conversation was held on Zoom um, uh, and, and, and the Zoom uh, was an account um, uh, created uh, by um, uh, a massive team and then uh, the conversation uh, wrapped up. We thought that, uh, you know, the conversation closed. We got some great dialogue and feedback. Uh, later on, uh, during the process, uh, the project team um, uh, started looking at the video to start to transcribe it and came across a part of the conversation, which is when the conversation had ended on uh, Zoom. So the formal conversation ends, and this is where um, uh, the conversation begins between uh, Pakeha Crown employee and um, a Brahmin woman employed by um, uh, the uh, Crown. And so we will reflect upon that particular exchange. But this exchange, we think, um, in our um, ethnographic notes is really powerful to discuss because um, it depicts the infrastructure of violence that is often hidden. Um, uh, you know, the, the way in which the violence of whiteness works is uh, by working in hiding, but the notion of talking behind the back, right? So you don't really get to see the violence of whiteness on your face, um, but actually it plays out as a script that is the under text and that is invisible. So um, we are bringing this into the play through our autoethnographic field notes um, and, and, and depicting sort of the interplays while of course, uh, keeping the identities of the participants um, 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 hidden to protect these um, identities. And the conversation uh, talked about how the concept margins of the margins was mansplaining. And the term mansplaining was used to um, uh, really question the fact that the interviews had focused in the initial part on talking to Rohingya men 
within that context. Now, one of the reasons, if you understand the Rohingya culture, the context, but also the history of sexual violence and genocide, when you're beginning conversations and dialogues within the community, um, you begin the conversations with men in the community because of the gendered nature of the violence uh, and the genocide that has constituted the Rohingya expulsion. And particularly when uh, discussing um, the ideas of sexual violence and family violence, the conversations need to be built in safe ways, working through multiple layers and interplays of power. So um, the two women, um, as they were discussing, um, in labeling that strategy of um, engaging the margins of the margins as mansplaining, were performing what we call a form of colonial violence and the violence of whiteness, using a language to um, erase uh, the work of the labor of building infrastructures for the margins of the margins. They further went on to suggest, so this is a, a fairly long uh, conversation. In the conversation, then uh, there is a suggestion that we have an agenda. Of course, implicit in that is the notion that there is a political agenda to doing um, that, this kind of work, which of course erases or obfuscates um, the fact that um, um, any form of work, including any form of work in communities, any form of research is always political. It is always embedded in politics. Of course, whiteness works to erase that politics and uh, culture-centered methodology works to make visible that kind of politics. In fact, uh, what this conversation demonstrates is the very nature of the political. So I will, if it is okay with you, Mahbub, drop on my ethnographic field notes and read from an autoethnographic reflection I had created. I say in this autoethnographic note, which you can find on my blog, uh, the racist politics of whiteness is convergent with feudal politics of caste. Here is where you see uh, Hindutva and Brahminical Hindutva intersect with the infrastructure of whiteness and the crown, which sort of explains uh, the ways in which Brahminism and Hindutva flow into uh, the crown structure here in Aotearoa. You see that in the context of violence prevention, you see that in the context of immigration, you see that in the context of uh, police, you see that in the context of um, um, uh, um, other kinds of crown structures such as ministry of women, for instance, or Ministry of Ethnic Communities. So it's really important, we argue, to interrogate the Brahminical formations that align with and congeal with whiteness to hold up whiteness. Um, in this um, the reflection, then I argue both white supremacy and caste supremacy work through the erasure of the voices of the outcast. So the outcast here being the Rohingya, the brown Rohingya body even as the outcast is turned into the object of intervention. So interventions designed from infrastructures of white supremacy targeted at communities mm -hmm. and at the same time erasing the agentic um, capacities of communities as participants in the process. So the language of mansplaining here precisely works to erase, precisely works to perpetuate another layer of violence. Brahminical privilege is a diaspora coll colludes with whiteness in perpetuating caste oppression. Caste oppression picked up and circulated into the networks of white Pakeha culture, find new modalities of perpetuating its violence. In response to the work of the CCA, imagine, and I talk about this as an imaginary scenario, a white Pakeha person and a white Brahmin person having a conversation about margins of the margins, a key concept of the CCA. The conversation goes somewhat like this, and this is a dialogic script mm -hmm. I had written up reflecting upon that um, excerpt. So this is the white Pakeha with a grimace expressing disgust saying, and what even is that? Margins of the margins? Now the white Brahmin woman picking up the Pakeha grimace and perfecting it says, oh really, how disgusting it is to talk about us migrants and put us in a box to call us as the margins. Then the white Pakeha woman goes, what even is the margins of the margins? Who is that? The white Brahmin woman goes, I know, right? It is not acceptable. Sorry, I mean, I myself a migrant. I live migrant identities. How can you call me margins? Now the white Pakeha goes, and who exactly are you centering in this talk? 
the white brahmin goes remember for you who is at the periphery is at the center for others i don't think of myself as the periphery of course you don't because you are part of the center of the white pakeha structure then the white pakeha goes oh that's mansplaining uh, this snippet of a fictitious conversation depicts the whiteness of the violence of erasure of course the violence is performed without having done the readings although numerous readings and lessons have been shared with the white pakeha and with the crown so we have sent readings after readings on the culture centered approach and the methodology of the margins of the margins necessary to the perpetuation of erasure of the margins is the deployment of woke discourse that serves the hegemonic positions of whiteness and brahminism so here you see how uh, the language of mansplaining is catalyzed to actually perform uh, this uh, violence as a communicative inversion then and this is communicative inversion in terms of turning materiality on its head mansplaining becomes a rhetorical tool for the white pakeha and the white brahmin to erase the margins to deny its existence and worse to turn it into a caricature to serve prakeha brahmin hegemony so this is how the crown if we really ask the question why is it why is the crown not um explicit about addressing hindutva here in Aotearoa, in spite of his uh, language of addressing Islamophobia in the context of the Christchurch attack, it is because uh, the Pakeha structure is complicit with Brahminical hegemony. Uh, lazy posturing, including the donning of the hijab and giving hugs and performing kindness, is an integral strategy that holds up white privilege and deploys primitive caste politics to bolster it, all under the pretext of progressivism or radicalism mediated by the also feminist sounding jingoism. Uh, the Savarna Brahmin in the diaspora performing the model minority is integral to the erasure of the margins, that there exist material registers of marginalization. And this is pre to the concept of the margins of the margins, that there exist material forms of marginalization felt on the body. So, of course, the uh, Brahmin women within the Pakeha structure working in the crown wouldn't be uh, the margins because you come from particular privileges as do yeah. we to find mobility within the structure. Uh, that there exist material registers of marginalization is the anchor to transformative social change. The white Brahmin collaborator with the white Pakeha culture maintains the infrastructures of erasure by denying the existence of the margins. Even worse, the white Brahmin takes up the migrant position to deny the existence of the margins and her struggles, erasing the possibilities of listening to the voices of the outcasts in the diaspora who are also the objects of the Brahmin's oppression in the homeland. So you see the Brahminical oppression in the homeland finds its mobility into oppression within the crown structure. And you think about the violence of this within the context of the um, ongoing infrastructure of Islamophobia and the empire is that Islamophobia is mobile not just in terms of white supremacist terrorism but in the form of how it is legitimized in the structures of the crown driven credibility and mobility. Erased from the discursive registers are the predominantly caste-based gender violence perpetuated by Brahmins both in the homeland and the diaspora. So this raises an increasing concern that has expressed by Muslims across various diaspora contexts where the concern is about the presence of Hindutva and right-wing Hindutva within violence prevention, particularly domestic violence and sexual violence prevention, often being funded by crown and state structures. Uh, the Brahmin profits from this denial of marginalization, both at home and in the diaspora. So, of course, what is the margins of the margins? That act of denying uh, enables one uh, to perform the identity of a migrant within the crown structure. Erased from the discursive registers are the everyday forms of gendered and raced violence perpetuated by the whiteness of settler colonialism, as well as the Brahminism of uh, feudal caste structures. That somehow the reference, I come back to the concept margins of the margins now, that somehow the reference to margins is disenfranchising, works to hold up the supremacy of both the Pakeha and the Brahmin. This denial can justify both Brahminical and white privilege, with the privilege continuing to talk about how to lift 
the burden of the soul, that top-down discourse, all along, all along denying the very agentic capacities of those at the margins. So our concern here is that when in the crowns, um, uh, emphasis on engaging migrants, on engaging ethnic communities, it reproduces the hierarchy mm -hmm. that continues to perpetuate erasure, very similar to how Tangata Fenua are approached in terms of the acts of erasure that we were talking about uh, yesterday, um, um, Aunt Selina. Not seeing, not witnessing the margins and attacking the discursive register of the margins is integral to the denial of the voices of those at the margins. To deny the materiality of the margins is a vital strategy to retaining and reproducing white prakeha and brahminical privilege. In our work with the CCA, therefore, it is vital to witness, count, describe, and challenge the politics of white Saverna denialism, which we argue are forms of violence. So, um, in fact, doing violence prevention work, we argue that the state and the crown are fundamental infrastructures for perpetuating violence through communicative forms such as uh, this. In a separate piece of um, autoethnography, Mabu Banai uh, note our own experiences of being exposed to this violence. Uh, so, for instance, um, uh, this violence I felt in my body as panic attack. You know, one night um, I wake up uh, in the middle of the night feeling like I can't breathe, my chest um, in congestion, and I have to run from upstairs down out into the back of our garden and then try to take deep breaths because I can't breathe. Mm -hmm. And that feeling is shaped by or is constituted by that violence that happens within an infrastructure that is supposed to address prevention of family violence and sexual violence. Um, uh, as resistance, then, let's turn to the discursive register. The margins exist. Yeah, the margins of the margins exist, as Phoebe uh, talked about in her talk up yesterday, and as we have been discussing throughout the various interventions. And here's really the critical point. These margins are produced by the very structures of white Brahminical colonialism that both white Pakeha and white Brahmins deny. So it's this act of erasure and denialism that the work of listening to the voices has to foreground. Back to you, Mahbub. So that was my second project, family violence and sexual violence project while working in Kia. So I came in New Zealand in March and, and started to work with the Rohingya people. You know, after coming to New Zealand, I was also stuck up due to the lockdown. So three months, I was three or two months, I was locked down. And then we started to work with the Rohingya refugee people in, I came March, August or September. I just started to work with the Rohingya people. And in family violence and sexual violence project started in, October or November 2020. Mm -hmm. So just two or three months, I, I also faced this type of Islamophobic talks from the crown structure. Mm -hmm. So as Professor mentioned, this is also affect me a lot because, you know, I am also a Muslim and I am mm -hmm. taking interview of the Rohingya Muslim community and they blame me as I, I was the researcher. So it's, I was at the time I was thinking, whose country I came to for my higher education? Where I where I am, so it affects me a lot. While just just second project, you, you you can just imagine. In March I came, then two months stuck up, and then I started to run a community a care project, first project that is low income household community facing for COVID nineteen, and the second project is family violence sexual violence project, and just I started to work with the project, taking only five or seven interview, and this type of talking we have to face. So it's it's a what should I say? I cannot express it. Even I cannot also sleep for two or three days. What what is going on? And I should mention here, I get a great support from my mentor, from my supervisor. He always support me, but I do not get any support from the crown structure. Even we mailed it formally to the crown people, but I do we do not get proper support from the from the crown structure from the government entity. So then they tried to label my taking in-depth interview as based on politics, religion, or Islam. It's the Islamophobic. 
for our family violence and sexual violence project total on 97 interview have been taken and among on 97 interview only 10 interviews are taken from the rohingya refugee community and that is also part from the migrant community because rohingya people definitely the part of migrant community and uh, according to kaza center approach rohingya people have been selected based on their marginality and migrant status not not based on politics religion or and anything else but they tried to label us like that so after when we sent mail to the government structure they just they tried to do some healing but i think that is not a, that is improper healing they came to the care lab they talk with us and professor also can describe it more accurately <laughs> but that is not actually a healing maybe they, they took out a guitar and sang yeah. vayata and um you know describe that as healing but that hardly felt healing to us mm -hmm. you know you can't perpetuate the violence of whiteness and then draw upon uh traditional culture or indigenous culture to somehow um, uh, turn it into a healing ritual <laughs> that felt more like another layer of violence well, yeah. to indigenous culture you know yeah. They are just coming with the guitar and just talking with them. And uh, as you know, they are, at the time we think they are they are the only, they are the want to know what we are doing because so you can say that in hierarchy they are in the top position. They came so again they ask us what are you doing, etc. But I think that that is not a healing procedure. Mm -hmm. And still we do not know the responsible the two lady what actions or what feedback was done by the Crown Authority. Still we do not know. Oh. That was our challenges, but still facing all the challenges, we have some success stories. Because, you know, um, we have completed the family violence and sexual violence project, and we submitted it to the government, mm -hmm. and it was appraised by the government. And this is the, some photograph, Minister Manama Davidson mm -hmm. came to the care lab, and they appreciate us. And uh, even, even after visit of the Manama Davidson, the ACC also made a meeting with us and they want to know what our works how we do for the work for the community and so these are the first success stories we have and i i personally also have some success stories mm -hmm. i still working with the rohingya refugee community and you can say though i am a researcher but i am now the part of that community so working with yeah, I have been offered to work as a settlement cross cultural worker of New Zealand Red Cross, and I am now working with Red Cross. And as a settlement cross cultural worker, I make you try to make a bridge between the New Zealand host community and the new area of the refugees through both cultural advice and linguistic support. And Professor is still working to co-create a voice infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Another thing, just last week or before last week, I attended a national hui out there, a refugee hui that held in. New Zealand Parliament. So we have all the things, we have challenges, but we have also some success stories. Mm -hmm. So so that's all I think. Thank you. Wow. I just want to commend you, Mahbubur, uh, for your journey of courage, for mm -hmm. your strength, for your resilience, and for the way in which you have um, survived up this the way in which you have come through this and the ways in which you continue to do the work of sustaining the uh, space for voice infrastructures thank you wow. amazing thank you so much for that Mabu. I, um wow that was really inspiring especially to hear of your successes and um and the journey that you've um undertaken since you've been here and i have to um mihiatu kiokoto um fano your fano that you've left behind um, your wife and um, your children um, your parents and that that they can't be here to share your successes with you so i want to make it to that um, um anyway i do have some questions here about the i, I was going to ask about the support from the government so in terms of the settlement here for the people that um that you were interviewing in that and so and to hear that they what the guitar was a form of healing for you and, and is that seen as support from the government or, or what sort of support have you had since um you found in the interview since they've settled here from the government 
Mainly the family violence and sexual violence projects is the government project. Yeah. It is in, in the JB view, you know, they are just they gave us the responsibility to find out the what, what would be the strategies to prevent family violence and sexual violence out there in New Zealand. So that the project is just given by the government. But the, the Rohingya refugee people, we took the interview as a part of that because we, we, it was decided the four communities in lived experience we have to take migrant community and then the aged community, the info community and the disabled community. And we have, we have taken the in-depth interview of the Rohingya refugee people as a part of migrant community. Mm. Okay. And that I think. And, and I think, you know, within that context, Ansarina, what that contributed to is um, a next layer of support for much like how you have the support in fielding yeah. uh, to carry out um, a prevention initiative led by Tangata Fenua. Yeah. Um, there has been support for uh, violence prevention initiatives at the community level for um, migrant communities to lead that, you know. Oh, yes, yes, sorry, I understand that. I'm talking about a different context here. I'm talking about, so when the government bring the, um, you know, the, bring the migrants in that here and you settle down, mm -hmm. it, well, are you just left to fend for yourselves? I'm talking about continued support from the government. Are they still there? Like in Fielding, we have a migrant day or something and everybody get together and we have it once a year for all the new ones that have come in. Because for me, my pakaro is, is that if the government going to bring you here, then why aren't they bringing you to our marae? and having a proper porphyry from our view, from a Māori te ao Māori point of view. It's not just for the government to bring you in, but if we want to be a partnership in this te why are we still, why are those doors still closed to us? You know, you, you are, you, you know, you're manuhiri to us. We want to invite you to our world yeah. too. And why aren't we seeing this as Māori as, you know, if we're going to be a partnership, why is it just the government bringing you in? We should be too. We should be bringing you into um, Pōwhiri, you into, into Aotearoa. Do you get that opportunity? Um, we are working with the Rohingya refugee people. Mm. That They are brought to the New Zealand government under the third country settlement process. And they are... When they come to the New Zealand, they come under the permanent residency. But if you think about the migrant people, migrant people sometimes come as a with just as a work visa, mm. and then after staying here, they try to find out the permanent residency. Mm. And when they get the permanent residency, after that they get some facility from the government. But before permanent residency. I think migrant people do not get any services from the government. Mm. Uh, Aunt Selina is asking a wider question, though, and this ties in with what Maurice was saying yesterday, yeah. which is that uh, there are uh, a part of the whiteness of the migration mm. structure yes. is that the Tangata Fenua are erased mm. from the structure entirely. Yes. So um, uh, that, um, uh, that uh, ownership of inviting migrants yes, in yeah. as manuhiri mm -hmm. is is not held by maori and maori are yeah. not accorded uh, right. the dignity of yeah. that space which you would argue Aunt Selena, suppose that virus a fundamental principle of that yes, yes, uh, there yes. might be a claim there in terms of how yeah. um the migration process yeah. and the racism of it violates uh, the principles of uh that's yeah. right and the partnership because i mean we've been in partnership with that for a very long time but what i'm saying in terms of the government and kawanatanga where is their partnership because we, if we want to you know if we want to be together then why aren't they you know like for anybody actually even onto our marae we always have a pulpit for the manuhiri right. and why aren't we given the same opportunity yeah and which you that, think Aunt Selina, then that would look so different mm. if 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 tangata fenua were to perform pulpit in community yes, in yes. context say in highbury where That's you have right migrant refugee communities mm. living alongside Maori and Pacifica mm, yeah. communities to invite into the community right. as opposed to this kind of performance that is held mm. by the whiteness of the crown where white whiteness will dictate okay tick mark we yeah. have performed tikanga so we are That's going right. to bring somebody to come and play the guitar yeah. and yeah. now we have done 
our Maori part of the Tikanga and the protocol. Yeah. And yeah. We move. So that actually, what we are arguing in this work is that that perpetuates more violence. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. And then right. it actually creates a space for invitation because on one hand, it erases Tangata Fenua mm -hmm. um, and it co-ops the culture. But on the other hand, mm -hmm. it then uses that to justify and legitimize the racist violence of the crown. Mm -hmm. So that when it has done that and it has brought in the Tikanga, mm -hmm. you see as migrants, mm -hmm. we have very little that we can say to that right. because we yeah. don't want to disrespect mm -hmm. the Tikanga, although it feels to us mm -hmm. as yeah. so superficial mm -hmm. and on the surface, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, probably for both of you, actually. Um, Great presentation. Um, mm -hmm. I consider myself a feminist, so I think it's really sad to kind of use that discourse to erase, you know, voices in the margins. Uh, I'm just wondering what the process was following, you know, seeing this footage, because, I mean, you said you didn't want to reveal um, identities because of, you know, ethical, you know, issues mm -hmm. within the universities, but don't you also have an obligation as a researcher um, to stop the violence from, you know, going forward? What, did, what was the process after you found the footage? Thank you, Phoebe. What a great yeah. question. Yeah. Um, we debated with that, really, uh, particularly because we debated about what are the implications of that, not mm. just for us, mm. because we were experiencing this violence while doing the work, mm. but also in terms of how we prevent it from happening in the future, yeah. especially because our concerns were about Islamophobia in the crown structure. Yeah. So we raised it as a complaint. And we left, we kept email um, uh, trails of the complaint that we raised. And what we were told is because it was within a contract setting, the way the Crown was going to deal with it was through its internal processes. But then we followed up and we have multiple emails then asking, OK, have you dealt with it? Yeah. Because it's great that you have come and said the apology, but also the apology was given by uh, people in the crown structure, in the bureaucracy, but yeah. but not by the two people who had perpetuated the violence. They said something about their internal processes, you know, yeah. and that they were taking care of the internal processes. But you see, this is what makes this process so opaque, because at the end of it, we had no idea then about what is it that they did to follow up with this. And mm -hmm. I guess that raises yeah. maybe a broader question about the nature of contract work, because when you're doing contract work like this, the legalese of that contract work protects particular kinds of behaviors, which then uh, prevent um, uh, from raising the kinds of questions in public ways. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, what I have also since ha heard from Crown employees is that um, uh, that they are limited in terms of the complaint processes mm -hmm. internally yeah. when they raise these kinds of complaints. So mm -hmm. it seems like this is a perfect way in which uh, the violence just gets keeps mm -hmm. getting perpetrated without yeah. really accountability, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I guess it's frustrating, you know, because often, you know, we'll look at, um, you know, structural challenges and we won't put people in there because it's ultimately people that maintain the structures. And mm -hmm. I know that you've got, um, you you yourself would have had a contract, you know, with, with you know, with a group that, that you know, that, and then you couldn't put their names out there, but this would be such, you know, a great opportunity to stop violence from you know happening going forward um but yeah and I guess um, following on from that. So, so TB, I, you yeah. mean that um, uh, putting out the names would be yeah. uh, the way to do it, you think? I I mean, I can see how you, you couldn't, you might have not have been able to do that if it was in a research setting, you know, if you've got ethics in a university. Just my concern is if we're, it's often, it's so easy to say it's a, you know, it's a structural issue that will need to be addressed and um, put it at that level, but ultimately it's people that maintain structures and I feel like we need to hold people accountable for their yeah. role within that structure, but otherwise it'll just keep them here. It's yeah. kind of here. I, I very much agree with you. And I suppose uh, the question to think through would be what avenues mm -hmm. other than raising the complaint and continue to raise them mm -hmm. and writing about it in public ways, mm -hmm. 
um, what other avenues you might think are available. So, you know, one of the things, for instance, we can do is write in a white paper about Islamophobia and the crown and that how there is a fundamental uh, a disjuncture between the Christchurch call and the rhetoric of it, like we did with the kindness paper, right? And how there is a gap between that rhetoric and the actual practice. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, do I get your point about like holding individuals to account within the structure? So I suppose the question is when the structure is stating that we have dealt with uh, the people and then saying that because you're in contract, we can't tell you what it is. I suppose what is what are the avenues for us to make sure to pursue that, but also to hold the structure into account, you know? So are they still, do you know if yeah. they're still there? They're probably still there as far as you're aware. They're still working within, within well, you probably can't say, you can't say what organisation, but are they within um, like national stakeholder organisations or the ministry? I think so. Mm -hmm. we, um, on a legal perspective, yeah. what you're talking about, mm. you need to be careful yeah. on how and what you actually mm. put out there because mm. at the end of the day, this university, if something goes out, this university mm. will be held to account mm. and then you'd lose the the university. Massey would end up looking really bad mm. and the perpetrators would actually come out smelling like roses. So mm -hmm. I think in that aspect, you've got to be really careful mm, yeah, it's on how you approach it. But I think you keeping going back and being mm. a pain in the backside of that organisation to see what they've actually been doing is a good thing mm. that you've done. So you're doing you're going the right way about it. And it can be frustrating because mm. that's what bureaucracy is all about. Yeah. yeah. But and even having said that, they have a legal obligation because mm -hmm. that's been brought up mm -hmm. by by you about the violence, that's the physical violence, I'm assuming, by their own people on what's happening. So they have a legal obligation to actually go and look into that. So I guess in this case, it's, mm -hmm. it's discursive, it's communicative violence, right? Mm -hmm. But I guess, Phoebe, your mm -hmm. point is that if this were to happen within an organization, mm -hmm. say if this were to happen within Massey, mm -hmm. there were processes yes. set in place. So I suppose, yeah. Phoebe, the question is, one would expect mm -hmm. that with the Crown, because this was brought up within the structures of the organization, that there would be processes set in place. I guess the question is, that as outsiders to the process, as contractors, we don't have access. So that's the opaqueness of the process. We don't know really what process was followed. Yeah, mm -hmm. and just a follow-on question. Sorry. <laughs> um, so how did you engage with women in the community? Did you, was that the next phase? Or I didn't, like, what, what kind of techniques did you engage with women? Or did you hire a female? Like, how did you um, navigate, I guess, the gender dynamic? Mm -hmm. um, I, I did not have permission to engage with the women initial, but mm -hmm. now I, as I could build my relationship with them, so now I can talk with them. But there is a distance maintaining when you know, if I take in the, the last project with this you know, in the meanings of health, I took some female interview also. And the, that is maintained as they, I can build up the trust with the female mm -hmm. community. So I can take the interview of the female also. But with the help of the community research, that definitely. And mm -hmm. and maintaining that when we take the sometimes I should say the environment, when we take the interview of the female, even I do not did not see his face, he sit beside another room, just in between me, mm -hmm. here, me, then yeah. researcher, and another room, the female researcher, mm -hmm. and then here my recorder. And I talk talk to the community researcher, he talk to the female and we just doing then. Mm -hmm. So, so I think Phoebe, there was another strategy we also followed, which was uh, but, but because there were not um, any women Rohingya translators, yeah, yourself, is uh, yeah. to to make sure that we had voices of the women to work with other migrant um, women community researchers. So we particularly had an Afghan woman community researcher who then serve that role of mediating to make sure that women's voices 
were being heard. But that also made it difficult because there were three layers of translation now yeah. um, that needed to take place in order for those voices to be heard. You didn't um, consider just doing it in, you know, the other language and just translating it up? Would that, would that yeah, my, I didn't take the interview in Rohingya language. Yeah. Then Rohingya language, the community is translated into Bangla language, and then I transcribe it in English. Okay. Okay. So three layers. Yeah. Second. And I tried to find out a female community researcher, but the female Rohingya people do not know English at it. And they are also not, they do not know English, even, even they do not know Bangla. And they are also not interested to work as a community researcher. That's that problem I faced for a lot of Because there are some cultural obligation, religious obligation to work with a male, a female. So, you know, right now, the work that we are doing in Auckland, uh, PB, with the migrant women leading this process, and this is being led by Muslim women. So mm -hmm. they are able to bring in Rohingya. Uh, women but also what is really beautiful about that Correro is that it's not framed around violence prevention it's framed around well-being and uh, building a strong community so even the languaging mm -hmm. the cultural context mm -hmm. of it is very different um, through which they are able to build that space mm -hmm. uh, but that really gets at a vital question which connects with your paper which is how do you build infrastructure for the voices of the margins of the margins mm -hmm. at those intersectional spaces who are so mm -hmm. thoroughly erased from the discursive spaces. Yeah, yeah. And sorry, really much time. Um, last question. Um, so a translation. Um, what? How did you navigate the translation kind of system? Did you have someone checking it, or did you? How? How? To me, I, I find it hard um, to kind of understand how you can translate languages sometimes because. You know, it's a kind of a different way of seeing sometimes. So I'm just, I wonder if you could talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that process of trying to yeah. have yeah. an interview and put it into the different contexts of English, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah, yeah. You know, at first I expressed my question in the community research part, then he translated into Rohingya language, and the uh, participant answered it into Rohingya language. He again translated it into um, Bangla language, and it is recorded. And while working with the Rohingya refugee people, now I also understand the Rohingya language. You know, I know 50 or 60 percent Rohingya language. I also understand. So whether the community leaders are actually giving the right answer to the of the participant, that I can compare now. Oh, so you have you, you yeah. Have I, I I I also have that yeah Rohingya language. Some mm -hmm. I understand 40 or 50 percent Rohingya language. Yeah. Okay. And at last, and translation works mainly done by me okay. because oh, because it is taken in Bangla or Rohingya language. Mm -hmm. So it's it's also another responsibility of mine to translate yeah. into. And if needed, Professor also helped me because he also understands Bangla and also Hindi language. Are there any difficulties in that translation process though, trying to express something in English? Does that make sense? Do you have any challenges with that, like with the write up? We do, and which is why sometimes we leave the um, particular code or a particular word that might be really salient in the language mm -hmm. and then try to approximate the closest translation that there will be because um, uh, certain concepts just don't translate mm -hmm. into yeah. um, English. Mm -hmm. and, on, and also you see uh, in this context, like when um, Mahbubur, uh, for a, a, a section of the violence prevention work, I was interviewing you know, yeah. community members. Mm -hmm. And when I was doing that, they would tell me that, hey, we could speak in Bangla because I have lived in Bangladesh or we could speak in Hindi, Hindi yeah. um, because I've lived in India or have migrated through um, India. Mm -hmm. So then the whole interview, you would actually hold in that language. So I'm not translating um, mm -hmm. even. I'm just thinking in that mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. to do it but they are translating though because um uh, the interview is being carried out in say bangla or hindi mm -hmm. and not in the rohingya language mm -hmm. so there's already one layer mm -hmm. and then think about another layer when that is being translated and transcribed i always because i've done some translated interviews i always worry i'm getting this kind of simplified version you know what i mean it's like yes. that's something that i kind of it is. That's yeah. really interesting. 